We are off to Australia to talk to James Barnard, who's a freelance logo designer. Hey, James. How's it going? Uh, how's the <sighs> weather back in the UK? <laughs> As you can tell, James isn't from Australia, but um, we'll find out how, how he ended up there, perhaps as part of this story. As ever, how about we get started hearing how you got started being freelance? Sure. So um, I am a logo designer, but previously my first job in graphic design was just a generic, uh, you know, all-rounder digital designer. I worked, my first job in uh, design was for a publishing company. I worked for uh, Nat Mags, which then turned to Hearst Rodale. So I worked for Runner's World magazine and Men's Health magazine on their sort of advertising and editorial uh, teams, just doing things like um, email newsletters, flash adverts, that kind of stuff. And then I sort of bounced my way around uh, a few different publishing houses. I went to Bauer Media and then eventually um, the Daily Telegraph, which is like kind of like my last full-time role. Um, it actually wasn't my last full-time role because the one I went into after that, which was like head of digital for um, the times in the sun I absolutely hated and it's the reason I went freelance it pushed me into that freelance career it was just my, my final full-time role was doing so little of the actual graphic design work and more of the kind of managerial side of things that mm. I um, just was not enjoying it anymore there's too much admin too many um, too much putting out fires dealing with little you know managerial issues and HR things that weren't to do with the actual grunt work of design and I just missed it I missed it so much I think I lasted six weeks in that role before I went um, I quit the job with no other job to go into and went freelance inverted commas to try and pay the bills while I found something new and really quickly after um, a few weeks of the new freelance life I realized this is all right isn't it? I could take naps in the middle of the day I can just run an errand whenever I want and not have to you know be under anybody's thumb and I just I never went back and that was something like eight or nine years ago I've been freelance freelancing for now but I started out nice. as like a, a gun for hire I went to all the um, agencies in London and um tried to find just work just to pay the bills while I had absolutely no work coming in. And I worked for a few agencies in London as a kind of gun for hire. So I was like a freelancer on a day rate. I would go into the office, do what they told me. And then um, after a little while, you know, COVID sort of happened and I was suddenly, and then my first child was born and I was then uh, working from home a lot more. So I was trying to find my own clients and yeah, things kind of sort of snowballed from there. Okay, there's a lot in there though. So, like, what was the experience like? First of all, you know, like, if people are thinking about going, the, the this, well, there's various different ways of freelancing, right? But one is like going going into an agency is one sort of relationship, and they're finding the end client. You're doing their thing, but yeah. another, as you say, is finding your own client. So, first up, when you were going into the agencies, like, what what do you feel worked? for you there like did you struggle to find the work no honestly i didn't I, I found it quite easy if i'm honest because i had that background of um working in the publishing industry and especially somewhere like the daily telegraph where the time the deadlines were so intense it was a daily national newspaper we worked really quickly there so that was like a real baptism of fire like i was you know absolutely flying when i worked in um daily telegraph and also got me loads of experience in print and digital so i was kind of like a really good all-rounder known for being kind of quick in the software so when i went into agencies sat down at a desk i was absolutely flying they were giving me work and i was turning it over so quickly they were struggling to find work for me which was kind of good and bad because you know you, obviously you want to do a, a good job for them and, and work quickly but a lot of the time i won't lie i was sat there twiddling my thumbs waiting for work to come in because it was taking them so long to brief me on jobs and i was turning them around so quickly um that i was just kind of you know twiddling my thumbs most of the day it was kind of weird and did did you have because you know you'd obviously been an experienced and you know high big companies like had you built up a network was that any use to you or was it almost like starting from scratch going in albeit here's my experience to show you yeah i had a portfolio so there were some odd clients trickling in and i also was um burning the candle at both ends while i had my full-time role i was pulling freelance jobs for my own clients evenings and weekends while i was working alongside a full-time role um also when i was in the publishing industry they have 
let's say uh, an industry like Bauer Media, they have something like 20 magazines, more than that, I'm sure they do. It's absolutely a huge um, library of magazines that they have. And each one of those departments always needs extra design resource filling. So what would happen was I would end up doing little bit, little odd jobs for those magazines for different departments and earning kind of bonus money on top of my salary each month, which was actually paid through my normal salary, but it was like my own little sort of half oh. freelance gig at the time. So when I eventually went freelance and you know pulled the plug on that last full-time role i had some contacts already from the industry that i could kind of lean on but it was it was kind of you know it wasn't great fun work it was a lot of um you know digital display advertising a lot of jpeg outputs that kind of stuff so it wasn't very much fun paid the bills but uh it wasn't very rewarding so i kind of dropped that as soon as i and it could, and took on a couple of retainer clients just through contacts that I'd made in the industry and a little bit of um, SEO help as well. So this is way before I was doing the logo design thing. I hadn't sort of niched down into logo design um, until something like five years ago. And um, so I was doing everything, absolutely everything, being the sort of generic, saturated market of generic graphic design, print advertising, flyers, email newsletters, you name it, I could do it. Um, it wasn't until I decided to sort of niche down into logos that finding the clients actually became easier. Um, I'm sure we'll talk about this, but, you know, setting yourself as an expert in one thing allows you to attract clients as backwards as a, allows you to attract more clients as backwards as that sounds. Being targeted in one area totally um, allowed me to sort of target more logo design clients and therefore actually get more from that by being the kind of expert in that in that niche. Yeah. Did you know what you were doing business-wise when you stepped out? Nope, not at all. I had, uh, it's, it's one of the horrible things about our industry is that there's very little education around like the actual business of um the business of design you know what to do in terms of like how to price your work how to deal with clients how to um you know run retainers or timesheets and all that stuff i learned a lot about sort of time sheeting and and billing from my time in agencies but it wasn't until i started watching all of um chris doe's content from the future when i started learning about the business of design like how to value what i do how to put a price on it how to package it up so it's easier for, to sell it and um i basically took my website and sort of rewrote everything on on the site to target better seo terms so i could be more discoverable and to put my um, my logo design packages on there sort of as a tiered structure, you know, good, better, best. And that allowed, you know, for, that meant for a lot more leads. But my SEO was really, really good. It was something like, if you, if you Googled freelance logo designer London, I came up as number one. All because I tweaked a few things on my website. I changed the copy and the content uh, just to kind of once I decided to niche into that area, really sort of specialize on it, removed all the portfolio work off my portfolio that wasn't to do with logo design. So it was absolutely specialized. And that just started bringing the clients in. It, it wasn't like crazy amounts of leads, but it was decent and it was enough to live on. Yeah. You, it's interesting you say about um, time sheets and, you, you know, your first experience in an agency was of a day rate. And yet, because you'd worked in this intense atmosphere in the press you were quick yeah. so did you feel like you were being penalized by yeah. by charging for your time totally and it took me so long to realize that you, you think like by working faster people will hire you because you're more efficient but you're right you you get penalized because you work quickly especially if you're charging hourly so yeah it was a huge kind of like bombshell moment when i realized that like, this is insane why am i billing um hourly on little projects like that I guess at the time it was because I was working on lots of small little projects and it was easier to do that rather than sort of bundling things up as like a package of say like digital display um, design work and giving them a certain number of deliverables rather than a certain number of hours. That would have been made much more sense and I could just bust those out really quickly, do them in half an hour and charge what I, you know four times what I would, would have been paid hourly. But yeah, it did take me a while to kind of realize that. But as soon as I kind of figured it out, it meant that, you know, I'd had, I had a kind of floor price for everything. And um, it meant that it was easier to, to build clients. They knew up front what the whole project was going to cost. And it just made for a much more sort of better customer experience. It was just finding that um, sweet spot with pricing that is still today, you know, one of the hardest parts about what I do, actually. It, it, it's so fluid 
um, I made a massive mistake a few years back of putting my prices on my website. Like that, I was getting kind of annoyed with um, people asking me to do logos for 50 quid. And, uh, you know, it's kind of insulting when someone of my experience has asked, you know, to either do something for free or to do something on the cheap. And so what I did was I put my floor price on my website and I got no leads in two months. So it was just a case of, um, you know, actually getting people to inquire and then eking out a price from them and working with them to find their budget and guiding them through that process a little bit more was the way to do it rather than going, this is my floor price. It's set in stone. It's my way or the highway, um, which just didn't work. And I almost, I almost went under, I'm not going to lie. Like the two months with absolutely no leads coming through, dried my cash flow up completely until I, re I, I, I tried everything to kind of like stop it from going under I threw money at like Facebook advertising and Google advertising to try and get people to my website. That was a total disaster. Um, I, I halved the price of the floor price to see if that would bring in leads. That didn't work. It was just the, the case of that price being on the website it was so, it was so easy for someone to go somewhere else and just bounce to a competitor that until I removed it and then started those conversations back up from the, from the ground up, um, you know, it was just a total disaster. It just did not work. Man, that is so interesting because I mean, obviously, it's a very nuanced discussion, the whole prices on the website thing. But yeah. that experience is so clear cut. Yeah. See, so but even then, though, how do you so you take away the price, you get in lots of leads. How do you then not spend all your time dealing with people who are still trying to get you for 50 quid, for example? Like how what's that process like of filter <laughs> filtration? OK, yeah, it, 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 like. <laughs> Because I went through that experience of nearly losing my business because of this pricing problem, I then suddenly started looking at that and lead gen in a totally new light and was like, okay, I don't mind dealing with those kinds of queries anymore. Just give me leads. And if there's money to sort of mass out, massage out of a client, I can. It was interesting, while that those, those prices were on my website, the work that I did get was through somewhere completely different. It was like a Reddit post someone found me through. I hadn't seen my prices, came through. It was a, um, a logo design job or a t-shirt design job for a um, motorcycle club based in Texas. Like the coolest projects you can imagine. <laughs> um, I would have done it for free probably because it was just such a great project to work on. I think I got something like 500 quid for it. At the time I was like, cha-ching, yes, thank you very much. But uh, I would not have got that job had they gone through my website and seen the prices they just would have gone somewhere else so it was, that was quite an interesting experiment that I'm, I probably missed out on a lot, lot of opportunities where I might have taken the job on for cheap because the job was cool or the, the mm. timeline extended or other deliverables could have been cut from the project and that's what this what, what this project kind of made me realize is that you need to have a discussion. You need to talk to that client before you go back to them really with a budget, or at least find out a bit more about them so that you can kind of figure out where they are on the grand scheme of things. And then start massaging that um, budget out of them and working with them to kind of show the value of what you're bringing rather than, you know, here's my hourly rate. This is how much it's going to cost. It's more about the return on their investment rather than, you know, the upfront cost. And then from there, like, because it's logo design, I can kind of upsell services. So start with the logo, use the logo as the starting point of the sale, and then add things like websites and marketing material and business cards and all that jazz. It's interesting that you say massage. <laughs> what, what, what's the Barnard massage like? This Where, at needs what to be point branded, did... doesn't it? It needs to be something on my website. <laughs> the Barnard Massage. Welcome. It's, it's just like, because obviously you could have a conversation. You could get, re in fact, I've done this. You know, you get really excited. Oh, I could be editing this person's podcast. These guys seem like really great people. I really like this. And sure, on some instances, I might then tell them the price and then they might say, nah, we really can't. And I'm like, oh, but I love your project so much. And we negotiate. But yeah. on somebody else, they might, I might just have to say goodbye and think I waste did I waste is that time wasted mm -hmm. or is that somebody who might come back further down the line when should if I'd only have bought up budget sooner would they yeah. have stayed oh, yeah. like it's right, here's how I handle this at the moment okay so the, when you want to get in t contact with me via my website you go through a funnel so there's like a, a short questionnaire it's only like four questions the very first question is what is your budget range and that ranges from something like zero to a thousand a thousand to five thousand five thousand to ten and ten thousand plus whatever box they tick immediately tells me 
do they value this project? And most of them, you know, you, you know, as you would expect, would tick the lower end box. Those guys get an email. That I don't spend as much time trying as hard with those guys. I'll send them an email saying you're not quite there on the sort of on the sort of level that we're playing at here. Um, would you be open to spending a little bit more to discuss this? And that's just off an email straight off the bat. So immediately I've crossed that bridge. I've, I've dealt with the budget issue immediately and told them, you know, we're not quite on the same page. Would you be willing to increase to sort of, you know, bridge that gap? The ones that have ticked over, they get a dedicated, detailed um, response from me based on some of the questions that they've answered. And then usually I get on the call with them as, as soon as I possibly can. So schedule a call here, that kind of thing. And that allows me to kind of have that conversation and find out a little bit more about the project, um, find out more about their timelines. So if it's a longer lead, if it, it can be done in like three months or so, maybe we, we can bring the, the price down this first time. And on the proviso that if we work together in the future, I'll have to charge where I normally charge, that kind of wording. So it's all about having that first conversation. But yeah, I, I totally deal with the budget straight away. It's the first thing you see on my on my form on my website. And that kind of just sets the tone right off the bat. What about retainers, though? You've mentioned them. Are you still... What, um, once you've no. decided to niche... Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> what, <laughs> no, what was your experience of retainers? Like? Maybe it just anymore. doesn't suit... Maybe it just doesn't suit logos in the same way. I don't it, know. Like if, if there's a bit of an offboarding process, let's say I do, I upscale and I, you know, provide something like a website, or maybe they have things like a pitch deck that they are willing to do themselves in something like PowerPoint, and they need a bit of design expertise going forward. I have one or two clients where I do work on retainer with them. Um, I don't like it though, if I'm honest, because it's again, it's like it's with retainers, it's like hourly. And you have to kind of time sheet it, and there's no real way around it in my experience. Um, so I, I do that kind of few and far between. Logo design is like more of a project. I could put a price on that project based on a certain number of deliverables, and then they pay a half upfront deposit, and then the final deposit is paid once the logo files have been delivered. So it's really set in stone. It's contracted, and kind of can't move away from that. If they move outside of things like revisions or, you know, like numbers of amends on a project, or they don't get back to me within a certain period, there are clauses in my terms of service that allow me to either to stop that job or to switch to an extortionate hourly rate uh, to take on, um, you know, revisions and amends. So, yeah, it's, I, I like to deal with um, pressing my kind of project basis. It just makes more sense for me. How, how do most of your clients find you today? Is it still via SEO? It was until my social media exploded. Uh, it's, it's something like 85% of my um, clients now come through Instagram, TikTok, or a little bit on YouTube. Um, Instagram is by far the biggest lead generator for me. It's it's huge. It's absolutely massive. And that's all become from like the first time I kind of went viral on TikTok, I posted um, basically something with me showing off. Um, I got a couple of my logos got into a, a book called The Logo Lounge, and that video did 3 million views. And overnight, I got 70 leads for logo design, which is more I'd got in like, I don't know, months prior to that. And then I was booked out for three months solid. So, and I have been booked out like that ever since. So it, social media is just, it was kind of, a huge mind-blowing moment like why have I not been doing this sooner um, and started putting way more effort into making good social media content that gives back to clients and designers and that's kind of been the story from from here on in it's just it's you know it's where the where the love is um all that little, so when, put when, more attention <laughs> to that as a lead generator totally when did you start well, putting out more concerted stuff on so social media. once I went, so I was always on like Instagram doing things like time lapse videos of me working in Adobe Illustrator, showing off my work. So if I ever got a new logo design project, I'd do a, a carousel post and show off the work that I'd just done. But no one really seemed to care about the portfolio side of things. You know, no one really gives a toss when you need to launch a new logo project. It's, it's cool for you and it's awesome to share, but no one really cares, do they? The, the things they do care about is when they get value out of your content. So as soon as you start teaching people or explaining difficult concepts in things like graphic design or logo design specifically for me, or showing your work, but in a way that kind of shows the process. So I do a lot of case studies on my um, account in a video process that I talk about how we got to that final design 
and with the browser of amends the routes that we took the sketches i did dealing with the client and their feedback and then showing the final product and that kills that's really great for both designers and clients because designers are learning about the process and how that it might work for them of how they should deal with clients themselves and then any clients watching this or people who want logos and seeing you know this is what it might be like to work with me in the future uh how do i get in touch with this guy so it kind of is so self-serving it's fantastic it's like i'm helping out one side of the audience and getting leads from the other it's brilliant how much time does dealing with social media I, and actually there's probably two sides to that there's probably content creation and yeah. just being social on social media Maybe. Yeah, it's huge. It is It is a huge chunk of my time now. But I, I talk about this guy all the time, Jamie Brindle. He's like um, this freelancer um, guru out of the US. I've met him a couple of times now, actually. He is. He says 50% of your time should be spent on new business and 50% of your time should be driving his, his current client work. And I see that, that new business side of things as my social media. So it, it is something like half my time is now devoted to creating content for places like Instagram and TikTok. But you wouldn't believe the how much that has diversified my income off of client work. Actually building a you know, following on social media, building a community allows me to do things like eventually sell courses, uh, digital product product products and then um you know paid advertising on, on my site and then the other things like public speaking and and sort of live streaming with people like adobe it's just opened up all these doors for me to the point where uh logo design is now actually not my main source of income anymore it's the the other side of things the the social side so it's uh, somewhere somewhere uh, mid last year i think it was the, the the scales tipped in terms of me being a kind of um you know content creator which is kind of scary um but you know quite exciting at the same time but it's content creation based in doing what you love which is what made you yes. go freelance in the first place that's right that's right and as a freelancer i could never do this as a full-time employee it, it, it mm. dedicates so much of my time i need to be able to split my day and manage my time how i need to in order to get this done so it is literally like i'll start the first half of the day working with on my client work and looking at my my leads and and sort of speaking to clients in that respect so in the morning will be you know getting on calls with people in the afternoon it'll be busting out a video or, or coming up with something um some kind of idea to do you know the next piece of content from so you know as a, if i was working in a job like a full-time role i would have to do all of that in the evenings and on the weekends and there's no way i'd be able to you know get that kind of a following so yeah the job the lifestyle has certainly led to uh this new sort of found fame as a content creator so this again so so, so many little bits of this to, to pick away at if that's all right yeah one right. though is that if you're getting, you know, you post a video and then 70 people are getting in touch, presumably in DMs to say, you know, I'd like a logo. W what do you do at that point? Are you just pointing them towards that form on your website or? Kind of. Yeah. So you, you'd you be surprised, actually. Not a lot of the um, leads come via DMs. I force them through to my website, especially on places like TikTok because it's harder for people to get in touch with you via messaging, or at least it used to be. They would have to go to your website to check you out and then get in touch. Um, so, and then if anybody messages me on Instagram, I have like a text replacement thing. I just press I, I, I in my um, iPhone now and it replaces it with a piece of text saying, sorry, I don't deal with leads on Instagram DMs. If you want to get in touch, email me here and we'll take the conversation there. It just allows me to track that conversation a bit easier because it'll get lost in Instagram DMs. So I immediately move them off the platform and capture that email and then, you know, get in contact, them, contact with them that way. Brilliant. In that case, on your form, is it saying, how did you hear about me? Because yes. you're obviously able to... It is exactly right. So yeah, it's that's the second question. How did you hear about me? Is it through SEO? Is it through Instagram? Is it through TikTok? And now I have a CRM that kind of pins that lead to um, a dedicated place. So I can always keep an eye on my analytics and see where all these leads are coming from. And if anything starts to dip or anything starts to you know grow, I can put more resources into that. But yeah, it's uh, like just looking at the stats, it's so easy for me to select. It's something like 85% of leads is through the social side of things. So it's just a complete no brainer to be yeah. putting my dedicating my time is that a like an automated crm type process what's the crm 
Yeah, so I work with a company called Bloom, and they have a um, portal that basically is just a, a from the call to action on my website goes through to a landing page with a really it's like a jot form thing basically just like a really really simple questionnaire but you can do all sorts with that i can i can book projects and do invoicing and contracts through that system as well um also have like um like a lovely little um project workflow so i can see which projects are coming up i've got it all scheduled out it's really handy like i don't need an assistant to help me with that kind of stuff so it's, it's brilliant um and i could also send emails from it as well so ideally when a lead comes through it's basically just be pressing a button assigning that um client to a specific tag and then sending them an email directly from the system and it's honestly it's turned my life around because it used to be i would spend an hour and a half in the morning responding to emails from all the, the leads that would come through now it takes me 10 minutes i'm like click 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 click, and they're all done ready for me to start my day amazing you you said you you don't need an assistant to help you do that so do you have any anybody helping you at all i do i do now yeah, this is one of the biggest challenges I faced as a as a freelancer was relinquishing a bit of control and hiring an assistant to help me do the things that just weren't a great use of my time. And I did a podcast last year with a guy called Josh Hall, who is um, like a web designer pro and runs courses on people on how to you know start their own web design businesses. And he actually did a one on one with me and sort of guided me through the process of hiring my first assistant. Broke, had me break down what are the pros and cons about my daily life. What do I like doing? What do I don't like doing? And how can I offset the things that I don't like to somebody else? And it took a while. I put the call out for an assistant at some point uh, last year. I was it was last year and now a lovely lady called beatrice who lives in germany uh, helps me out with my client presentations my logo exports building brand guides guideline documents for clients all the kind of stuff that i can do but it's not necessarily the most creative part of the job she totally helps me out with all of that and even now she's starting to come on board more with the actual concepting of around logos and now, before I start on a job, she does a little bit of research for me. She helps me out with a few concept ideas. She takes on some of the client brief questionnaires and answers and does her own thing for a little bit. And then I'll take that on and kind of pick up from where she started and, and finish the job. So it's been absolutely amazing. That's interesting, though, that it's, you know, it's not somebody who deals with your calendar or sorts out the emails because, hey, you can <laughs> tick that one off in 10 minutes. It's yeah. actually the client work side of it, the actual yeah. design bit of it. It's the time consuming side of things. Yeah, it's like like exporting logo logos and doing brand guidelines documents can be so, so time sucking. It's ridiculous, but it's so important. And every client needs to have one um, it, and making that beautiful presentation is half of the job with sort of selling in a new logo design idea. But it takes ages. It takes, you know, just a lot of grunt work with um, pulling up Photoshop mockups and I, I write all the copy for the presentations. I like to control that, and it's my tone of voice, so you are working with me. But when it comes to, like, exporting something like a business card markup, I don't need to do that. I can have somebody help me with that. Um, and that's what Beatrice does for me, and she's she's fantastic. She's been really, really helpful. Um, but now she's starting to, like, now that we've had that relationship and she's done all this kind of legwork with me, she's coming on board more um, for the sort of more creative side of things now, which is really exciting. So it can hopefully free up my time even more to the point where she might eventually take on the job, the jobs completely, and maybe I'll bring on somebody else to help out her with her grant design work. And, and now we've started an agency, which is quite exciting. The problem is at the minute is I, I'm too much of a control freak. I, I just absolutely have to control that process. And I'm part of the reason I think people are coming to me is because they want to work directly with me. Mm. And as a freelancer, I think that's kind of important. Otherwise you're kind of working with an agency. So this, this, you know, ums and ahs with that with me i'm not quite sure where i'm going to go i'm at a bit of an inflection point right now um but i still enjoy the client work and one of the great things about me still doing client work is it keeps me on the ground and it keeps me fresh with the software which allows me then to teach it better to others and make courses about you know what's coming out and the new features and releases of products like adobe illustrator i'm right on the front line i'm doing it with you so you know i'm not losing my edge so that's one of the yeah. reasons i think for me to kind of stay in the game it's I was going to ask actually about this, the sort of content that you're creating and putting out there. It's aimed at other design. Is it all aimed at other designers and yet bringing you logo work because people are just going flipping neck is good. Is that the, yeah. yeah. 
So the way, the way I treat it is I have like the four pillars of content. I'm not even sure I can remember these now. Design, <laughs> um, yeah, like software tips and tricks, freelancer advice, case studies, and there's one more. I always forget it. It's like the principles of design. So, or, you know, it's basically how to be a better designer and how to be a better freelancer. And what happens is my, my following has grown because of that value that I've kind of given back. But clients are looking at this or seeing it on their feed or anyone kind of interested in design, or maybe even someone that's just like searched on social for like logo designer, I'll come up because of that. And it's, you know, search on socials should not be overlooked in terms of SEO. If you do good captions, you'll come up in those searches for things like logo design when people are looking for it. And all of a sudden, who's this guy uh, who's got like half a million followers and can design logos like, you know, and then that's why people are starting to get in touch more. Also kind of means that I can charge a little bit more as well, because, you know, I've, I've got to a point where I'm working with bigger clients because of the success on social media. Um, I've set the tone a little bit with my content and, and there's going to be really no surprises now when someone gets in touch that it is going to cost a certain amount. So it totally helps. But yeah, I do all the content is for designers. It's so great because it just serves both audiences. Mm -hmm. graphic designers get something out of it. it makes me feel great because i feel like i'm teaching and imparting knowledge onto the next generation of designers and building a community at the same time it's honestly a complete no-brainer when was the first course or perhaps maybe not a course but when was the first time that you created something that you could sell to help the audience that you'd created so initially, when I had a bit of success on TikTok, I was getting questions from people in my in my um, on on you know interviews and things like that. Like, how have you done this? How have you built this following? So I made a short course about how to win more design clients with TikTok, and I did a little public speaking thing um, for a design summit a few years back. That was my first kind of taster into. Like I'd made this piece of content for this public speaking gig. I cut it into chunks and sold it as a course. Didn't do very well because I didn't market it very well. I didn't know how to sell it. I hadn't really built an audience and, and had no emails. I uh, didn't have an email list to sell to. A year or two later, I tried it again with um, my latest course, which was turbocharge your logo designs like how to go faster in adobe illustrator um and i partnered up with skillshare on this one because at that point i had a bit of a following and they kind of they contacted me and it's been amazing it's, it's a totally different experience like people like the fact that i can kind of explain um design principles and, des and explain design software really succinctly so i've had so much experience trying to get all this content down into under a minute for something like a tiktok or an instagram reels it now means i kind of really cut the bullshit when you know the, the, my courses aren't like wiffly waffly they're really truncated and to the point so when someone comes to my course and it's like an hour and 15 minutes it's kind of it's hard for me because i'm trying to get more money for the course but they look at the the length of the content and go, that's not very much and then someone does the course and they're like I just got more out of that than I probably would have done, you know, had I watched a six hour long <laughs> video. There's so much in there. So the reviews on like places like Skillshare have been so good and the feedback has been really glowing. You know, they have this little slider on Skillshare that says, does this course meet your expectations or exceed them? And like 75% of the, the reviews are like exceeded my expectations because there's just so much that I can say so quickly um, that it's just because of the, the nature of my content has just been so succinct I can really just get the point across now yeah it's cool isn't it but that actually that limitation that restriction of a 60 second video makes you focus but it yeah. doesn't mean that it has to be boring or super quick it just means that you get really good at yeah knowing how to deliver something so I, I script everything like i i i find it really hard to talk on camera or at least i used to i script everything when i do my social media so it's, i write it all out in notes i record to the camera say a line read it read it with the next line record and then cut all those clips together so it takes four minutes into you know under a minute and also it's meant that I'm better on camera and I'm better at sort of now I'm better at articulating with clients. It makes me a better salesperson. I'm totally um, getting practice by making this content that I'm, I'm actually able to talk to clients um, with more conviction and more gusto. And, and, and it's, it's absolutely fantastic. It just serves so many, it has so many benefits. It's ridiculous. You said that, you know, you didn't really have an email when you put out that first course, um, email list that is. 
what did you do to try and build that? Because you've got that social following, but what about people yeah. that you can just reach out I, to? That's still a working process for me, if I'm honest. Um, I chatted with a lovely chap, I'm sure you'll know who he is, Tom Ross, the CEO of Design Cuts. He really helped me with this about bringing my audience off the platform and trying to take more ownership of them. Because let's say Instagram closed down tomorrow, I would lose half a million people um, and have no way to get them back. So I've been slowly trying to build my email list by offering out um, freebies here and there, you know, like sections from my course, um, downloads, that kind of thing, trying to build that up. And also, um, that's another part of the business I've actually hired some help with. As a, um, I hired a copywriter to help me do my newsletters because I was really struggling to get those out every week. Um, a lovely lady here in Australia called Anna has now helping is now helping me with my um, content for my newsletters, which is such a weight off my shoulders. I always find that a real burden having to put those together, and now she's she's totally taken that on board, which is which is amazing. So yeah, it's about kind of um, providing more value there. Um, I've got a, a landing page for my newsletter now so it's actually like a dedicated thing i'm trying to actually build it it's still it's not huge it's like five thousand subscribers compared to the socials that's nothing but actually in terms of like when you want to sell to somebody or or plug a digital course that's pretty powerful so yeah still building that getting a copywriter on board is quite cool when you you said you found it a burden and yet you obviously good with words you like writing the copy in your brand guidelines and things so was it more like the time yeah that it, yeah that's it and this is one of been one of yeah. the hardest parts is that I, I i do think i'm it's one of my strong suits as always as all i've always written very well i'm quite articulate um when it comes to like creating articles and blog posts and it's something that i've always done um and it helps with the script writing as well it allows me to get my point across quicker because i'm actually de half decent at writing so when my new assistant anna sends me a copy over i'm really it's been quite a steep learning curve in terms of um my kind of tone of voice and i think she struggled with my direction because i wasn't really giving her any uh just you know she would write a newsletter for me and i, I would say i don't really say words like that I, that's kind of not how i speak i like to write very colloquially i like to write how i talk um so she's had to really learn quickly um, but she's done a great job and now it's getting to the point where I'll give her some topics to do for a newsletter, some topic ideas, and she'll structure that content out for me. And I'll just tweak a few things and we'll get it out there. Um, it could be getting to the point as well that she might start writing articles for me and, and helping me with that to bit, a bit, put a bit more content on my site in, in terms of like the actual articles. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty, it's only been something like eight weeks, I think it's been. So um, it's very, all very fresh. Awesome. Have we covered all of the there's obviously been this diversification in what you're putting out there and your income streams and things have, have we touched upon all of them all of the income streams um so obviously client work um a little bit from public speaking not too much but you know i do um whenever there's something like an online summit and um or something like adobe max was when i went to la last year to speak there um that is just a, you know something like ten percent of the business now, which is great, and I love that, and I really want to get more into the kind of public speaking space, um, affiliate deals and brand partnerships is a big one, and it, you know it does come from places like Adobe and and other software packages out there that do have money to spend to bring in customers. Um, Adobe is like my. I basically work for Adobe at the minute. Um, James Martin, made by James, he takes the mickey out of me all the time for this. That, that's my little cash cow at the moment. But it's it's fantastic. They're a great partner, and they're also a great company to work for. The the, the culture there is amazing. The the staff are just really on you know on point. They're really um, they know what they're doing. They're quite funny. They're quite um, culturally diverse. They're, they're an awesome bunch to work with. And I met loads of them when I went to Adobe Max in LA. So yeah, there's lots of um, you know different ventures there and then yeah the other one was digital products of course which i'm just dipping my toe into right now but we'll get there hopefully we'll expand that as the as the years go by and did i now uh i'm just gonna double check did i dream this up once upon a time did you create <laughs> did you create like um brands in order yeah. to sell a brand yeah a long time ago Man, you must be a, a diehard fan to know that. Yeah, no, a, a while back, I tried that out. So what, what happened was, um, so I've always had a line in my terms of service 
that says any unused artwork that I create as part of your logo design process belongs to me. So what happens is um, often you'll, you'll pitch a design idea to a client and they don't like it. In my mind, that's still a great design that might be applicable for another client. So I'll just put that on the shelf and maybe I'll pick that up later on. And that happened with um, a job a few years back where the client didn't like the logo. And I was like, oh, that's a real shame. That's a nice design. What I did was I made a fully fledged brand for something like a startup to just pick up off the shelf and run with. And it was called Karma, um, K-A-R-M-R. And it had this lovely sort of endless knot logo with a organic growth coming out the top of it. Somebody ended up buying it and I had a website to go with it. And um, the only issue with that is it's, just, it's quite an investment of time. Uh, to create a fully fledged black brand, like a full brand, brand guidelines document, um, the logo files, the marketing assets, the website, the presentation text. It's a lot of work to put in for no return, uh, which is the only reason I kind of didn't carry on doing that. So I tried it once mm. more with a company with a, a logo called Suno Wave. Not as, not as good. Um, and it just didn't sell. And I haven't, to be honest, I haven't really pushed it. I haven't really put it out there in terms of like marketing it at all. I imagine if I did it now on my channels, I'm sure someone would buy it. But um, <laughs> it's kind of just sat there at the moment and it's on my shop. So it was like a little secondary income. But it, it, the model just didn't really work for me because there was too much time I needed to put into it with um, no guaranteed return. Whereas like putting that same amount of time into something like a course, where it's much easier to sell that as in terms of value rather than creating a brand for a company that doesn't exist yet so that they can crowbar their company into that slot. Mm. It's a bit, bit harder. It, it, it rubbed a few people up the wrong way when I started posting about that because obviously people were like, well, a brand should be tailor-made for your business why would anybody do that but then there's other people who are like that's a great idea you could totally create a startup and then with about 10 to 20 hours design time fit it fill in the blanks and write the copy and, and change some of the design to fit what you need it to so it was an interesting model but just for me it just didn't work out it's when when i saw it it did make me think huh he's He's someone who looks like he's enjoying playing around with, I guess, like the entrepreneurial businessy side of. You might not have known what the hell you were doing when you started, James, yeah. but that you've, yeah. you you embrace it. That's what I saw when I saw yeah. that. It's just, it's just trying to make more money, isn't it? In the end, I was just I tried it all. <laughs> Honestly, like selling merch. Uh, you know, I've got I've got a shop on my website that sells T-shirts. Nobody buys those. Uh, it was just how to make more cash, to be honest. Um, but yeah, <laughs> like I say, it was just it was too much investment. I did one, and it's it's just sitting there now. So yeah. it's, it's so nice to have. I'm sure some will, will spot it one day. But yeah, it's not yeah. it's not a great business model, in my opinion. I introduce you as being in Australia. You're not from Australia. So when when did you when did you head out there? So um, we came here three years ago, right in the middle of the pandemic. So I had to do two weeks of quarantine in a hotel room with my daughter, who was two at the time, uh, which was not fun. But um, yeah, my wife's Australian. <laughs> we met in the UK uh, at, at one of my publishing role um, jobs, and we've been together. We've been married since 2016. So, um, yeah, I, I, she's Australian. We moved out here just because she had a bit of the call of home and she wanted to be back closer to her family and give, you know, the other grandparents a bit of time with the kids. And um, and we love it here now. It's, it's fantastic. My daughter's just started school, so I'm firmly entrenched in the Australian way of life. And obviously, being a freelancer, I can work from anywhere. The only issue is here is the time difference. It's a real pain with working with places like the UK and parts of the States. Like I think the East Coast of America is the most difficult because there's not one single hour in the day that crosses over in business hours. One of us has to take a call in the evening or early morning, something like five in the morning or 10 at night. So it's, it's a it can be a huge pain there but you know largely if you can get around that it's fantastic you know the, the lifestyle is immense um i have a, a spare room in my house which is my office a dedicated office which is very rare for, for a lot of freelancers i think i'm very lucky and and i do have two young children who i love spending time with and the freelance lifestyle means that i'm home for every dinner i get to put them down every night for bed and spend as much time as, as i possibly can in these the fun years when they're you know bouncing around and causing trouble um being very cute but uh yeah it's i wouldn't have it any other way now i don't think i could ever go back to a full-time role i think my last time i was in a full-time job it was eight or nine years ago so it's i'm too far gone now yeah. I'm, I'm a freelancer for life so work-life balance wise it's it's going all right <laughs> 
It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Like I do, I've always kind of burnt the candle in terms of like working evenings. Um, I rarely do weekends now. I definitely work evenings here though, because of the time difference, it's easier to get on the phone with people. And um, to be honest, the kids go down at seven. So I've got a few hours at the end of the day with a little bit of peace and quiet that I can actually get some work done. Um, and I start my day just a little bit later each day. I'll, I'll do a gym class in the morning and I'll probably pick up, you know, turn my computer on about 11 a.m. Um, most days, I have one day a week where I kind of do the normal nine to five when my daughter's in school and my son, who's two, he goes to daycare. But yeah, it, like I say, it's fantastic in terms of like being home for dinners and getting there for the bedtimes. There's no commutes. I just open the door when I'm, I'm there. So yeah, I, I wouldn't have that any other way now. Yeah. You say there's no commute, right? But do you, do you, is, do you have a process of like switching off between that, that workspace and the home space? Yeah. It's tough. I think that you, that's one of the biggest issues with dealing with being a freelancer, isn't it? Like that separation, um, just, just, just as a business owner as well, trying to do something that doesn't occupy your mind it makes you feel so guilty. It's like you should be putting all this time into your business. Like over the Christmas break, I had to do things like jigsaws just so that my mind was occupied so that I wouldn't feel guilty about not working on my business and turning the computer on and, and doing something there. Um, it, it's strange, isn't it? When, when you are your sole provider and you're the only person bringing in money, you feel like all your spare time should be, you know, invested in doing that. So it is really hard to kind of switch off from the work especially because of the social media with me as well now i have to really put my phone to the side especially at dinner time which i still struggle to do you know to put it over in the corner um one of my friends has a great piece of advice he gave me which i totally need to implement i haven't done it yet is when he walks in the door he puts his phone on the counter by the door and leaves it there he's allowed to use his phone as much as he wants but he has to go to the counter to use it so it's a physical thing he has to move to actually um you know, yes. pick the phone up and actually get to it. And it's meant that he's totally separated his phone and, and social life. So I need to, you know, put, start putting those barriers in place. Um, but it is really hard. It is really hard, especially as a freelancer, because you, you feel like you need to be on all the time. You feel like you need to be answering emails um, from clients and being timely with your responses. And that's tough. So yeah, it's, it's always a struggle. Do you also find that, especially at this point you're in now, James, where you've got successful client work, you build up this following, so there's all these opportunities that must be coming your way. And so many things where you go, oh, I could do this, I could do that. How do you choose what to actually focus on? Do, do you put things on a back burner? Or like, what's that like in your yeah, head? Yeah, it's usually the ones that can be done the fastest. Like, it's, I, I really want to do, like, write a book, for instance. It's one of my... Um, you know, goals in life is to write a book around the, the logo design. And I was actually approached a year or two ago to write a book by a publisher and got to the point where we couldn't really find the promise of the book, like what the book would do for people. Um, but at the same time, that project is so long. That's like months and months and months of work, which I would have to chip at over the course of a year. Whereas something like making a video of social media, I can do in a few hours and it's done. So it's always been about like, you know, finding the projects that I th think can be done in the timeliest fashion, um, which will keep me interested in the project, first of all, because I always struggle with that, like losing interest in something as, as time goes on, especially with logo design, because, you know, sometimes those projects can drag. Um, so, yeah, keeping that momentum has, has been kind of hard. So something like a digital course, like a longer course about the full process of logo design um, is something I've always wanted to do. But that I know from experience now that that's like a three month to four month project that I would have to put client work off for to get done because I just would not be able to dip in and out of it. It's too distracting to switch in and out of some of a project like that. My last course I did in the space of six weeks and it was so intense. I, I dropped all my client work, really put the back burner on the socials just to get kind of get through it, I filmed it and edited it all myself, scripted it, screen recorded everything, made the website, did absolutely everything. I was so burnt out by the end of the process that I kind of needed to take a holiday from that. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll get back to that at some point. So yeah, I think it's just a case of me finding a project and being able to project manage it so that I can dip in and out of it over the course of a few months. Um, yeah. is one of the reasons, one of the sort of um, ways that I'll make a decision on what to do next. Yeah. Man, that passive income is so easy, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's insane. No, it's, no it's James, uh, 
I always do this thing where I ask for three facts about yourself to make two true, yeah, one a lie, about and let me yes. figure out the lie. What do you have for me? All right, I, I've really struggled with this. I'll be, I'll be honest, mate. I thought I would stay in the theme of you know going viral. Okay, so I've gone viral a lot. Some of my videos have done very well. Before doing content with um, graphic design, I've actually been viral twice before. So I'm going to tell you three things that I've gone viral for, and you have to pick which one I didn't go viral for. Okay, right? cool. Okay, I've, ri I've written these down so I can word them, and I'm going to try and lie as best as possible here. Okay, here we go. I was once featured in almost every national newspaper in the UK, all because Nestle forgot to pay me a competition prize. Number two. I was once featured in almost every publication in Ireland because I look a little bit like one of their politicians. Number three, I was once on the front page of Reddit and then all of the video socials like Lad Bible and Facebook at the time after a video of me kicking a snowman went viral. <laughs> oh, I hope that's true. Um, okay. What 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 was the competition for you won with Ness I with Nestle? Okay. okay. When I was a kid I found a um a green polo in my packet of polos and I won ten pounds. And I sent it off to Nestle and didn't hear anything back for something like seventeen years <laughs> until I was walking to work one day, saw a kid eating a green sweet and went, hang on. Hey, I never got my tank, and I remembered. So I wrote a letter to Nestle. Um, the letter went viral, and then they responded with a check for ten pounds and a packet of polos, saying <laughs> sorry. And the headline in the newspaper was Nestle issues an apology. Oh, Terrible. okay. Surely this is true. Uh Either that or you have done wonders with your backstory. Because that's brilliant. <laughs> yeah, these all have huge backstories. So, yeah. Um, Which one's right? Which one's right? That does like, sound like the sort of promotion that they would do. Too I can't see story. Netflix making the same documentary that they did about the kid who won a, a jet <laughs> yeah. plane from Pepsi. The, all those oh, yeah. Ago. Yeah. I saw that. <laughs> but, the saga um, of the polo. Okay. You look like an Irish politician. But, yes, but but how did they pick that up? How did how did you end up in all the newspapers? They, uh, I the politician was, um, they were, uh, what's the word? They were campaigning at the time, so they were on the TV, and I saw them on the TV, and I was like, it looks quite a lot like me. And one of my friends <laughs> sent me a picture of them saying, "What? Like you look just like this bloke?" So I tweeted him with the picture, saying, "I'll be your stunt double if you want." <laughs> and he retweeted it and all of the publications picked it up and uh i was on the home page of the bbc news ireland and he and then went to the houses of parliament and met him you did not what what hang on which houses of parliament the big ones the ones in london the ones in london so this is a northern ireland politician Yes, he was in London right. at the time. Okay. Mm, is that true? <laughs> okay. Um, and the last one. And I hope you take this as a compliment, right? Because you're a good looking chap, James. So Stop now I'm it. thinking Stop could it. this. You look more like Hugh Jackman. Could I imagine a. An Irish politician a that looks like Irish Hugh Jackman? Look like Hugh Jackman. I've never heard that before. Thanks, man. You made my day. <sighs> Okay, number three. So you end up kicking a snowman. Why did you kick the snowman? I feel I, so, I don't want us to turn into therapy. This, but... Okay, this was in 2014 in um, a park in London. Uh, I was with my wife and we made this snowman. She's from Australia, so she's never seen the snow before. So snowman was a big deal. We made this huge snowman with an enormous ball for the base. Um, and then it was like getting a bit cold. We're going to go home. But there were some kids like eyeing up our snowman nearby and they were totally gonna like kick it down so i thought sod that like i'm i get that privilege as the person who made the snowman i'm kicking this snowman down so i take a running leap at the snowman kick it 
my foot slips over the top of the snowman and hits i hit myself in the balls this, my <laughs> wife filmed this by the way um i posted it to reddit and it hit millions of views and and then it went on places like lad bible and facebook and with the with the title snowballs <laughs> oh my god these are amazing noise <laughs> right so i have to pick one which isn't true yeah the snowman story sounds like it could totally be true we don't often get snow in the uk that is that good so you would have been excited you would have gone out mm-hmm. especially with an australian wife yeah. or girlfriend at the time newspaper <sighs> would Nest do nestle even make polos island northern the northern irish politician is a really odd one to come up with but I don't know whether, and especially the idea of then going and meeting him at the uh, at the Houses of Parliament. Yeah, I don't know. I reckon it's the Northern nothing. Irish politician. That's the lie. Uh, do you have your web browser up in front of you? <laughs> Google. Go on, what's what's Google his name? Colum Eastwood doppelganger. Check Colin. Colum, C O L U M. He's from Northern Ireland. He is the leader of the SDLP and he looks exactly <laughs> like me. Hang and on, there should be a video. Of, yeah, and he should be, there should be a video there of me meeting him at the Houses of Parliament. It was nuts. That is true. That was 100% true. Uh, oh my God! <laughs> it really is. If you type yeah. that into Google, and go to images. You see the two of them standing next to each other. <laughs> he, he, there, there are from certain angles. He looks exactly like me. It's ridiculous. We stayed in touch uh, ever since that. Um, he retweeted that. It got picked up by. You wouldn't believe the day I had. It was insane. That it got picked up by every national um, publication in Ireland, pretty much Northern Ireland. It was on the homepage of the BBC News Irish website. <laughs> I was asked to go on the radio. Um, but I turned it down because I just didn't. I was so worried about saying the wrong thing or getting into trouble. Um, it was the, absolutely crazy. So yeah, that's that's absolutely true. That do you want to have brilliant. a guess at which one is the lie still, or do you want? Would you that, like me to just? Uh, do tell you know? You? Do you know? I will. <clears throat> What's funny is one of the images that comes up as well is a picture of uh, Colin Eastwood meeting the President of the United States, Joe yeah. Biden. But I'm yeah. looking at it now and thinking, but is it Colin? Or Could, be me. Could be me. Could be me. Because the one of you two next to each other, it's really hard to know who's who. That's amazing. He okay, is a little right. bit shorter than me, um, so I had to stoop down for the picture. But yeah, lovely bloke. <sighs> All right, Nestle never coughed up ten pounds. Apology is a brilliant headline. Maybe you've even seen it somewhere, but that didn't happen. Uh, I'm afraid it did. Oh uh, my god! I've never me, been so I bad went. at this game. Oh, it's the behind leg. Which is the check? This is the check they sent me. I probably got oh the post-it God. notes. If you're, if you're watching online, I have it framed on my wall. The letter I wrote to Nestle. Um, they did. They responded 17 years later with a box of polos and an apology. Um, and my letter that I wrote to them had like loads of headlines in, like you know, you left me with a void in my childhood, like the <laughs> void in the center of your suite. Um, it was brilliant. I was on every. I was in every single national newspaper as a small little headline. It was on like the Huffington Post. It was <laughs> ridiculous. Uh, the fake one is the snowman. I made that up. So yeah, I'm it's just absolutely so bullshit. Here. Cross with myself. <laughs> I win. Well done. You were, well, they you. were brilliantly told. Well played. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, James. If you could tell your younger self one thing about being freelance, what would that be? Oh Jesus! Um, don't be afraid to relinquish control, more control. Basically, hire an assistant, get there faster, and get on camera. Get on camera as fast as you possibly can. I can't tell you how much my life has changed by um, imparting the knowledge and passing it all on to the next generation of graphic designers. I had the idea for it years ago, honestly. I saw some um, videos by a company called InVision about making like design snacks, and I had the idea to do it. I just didn't have the conviction to kind of um, mm. put it forward, but um, it just took one video going viral to give me the, the motivation I needed and the leads that I needed to keep that kind of content coming. So yeah, get on camera and relinquish some control. 
And I love the fact that you said that getting on camera also made you better dealing with clients, the totally. confidence that you got from yeah. that as well. Absolutely. Yeah. It's but, so, it's so you, handy. So it's a handy skill to have, definitely. But if... And you know what? I would urge you to go and find James online and follow him if you're not already. Check out the sort of stuff that he's creating. His videos are brilliant. Thank you. But um, but do you put across, you know, like when people talk about putting across their life, you know, like showing, you show behind the scenes of your work, but do you, do you keep that side of everything private? I don't see you on the beaches in, nah, in Australia. I don't really share that kind of stuff. I have a yeah. I have a personal social account, and I keep all of my kids to to that. So that only you know it's, that's private. That part of my life isn't for public consumption. Um, I don't show my. I mean, I have shown my fa my kids' faces on my socials before, but just kind of in passing on stories and stuff. Um, yeah, that kind of that side of my life is a little bit private. But yeah, I, I'm not posting holiday snaps unless. I go somewhere to do a public speaking gig and that totally is a trip for me and I'll post about that. Yeah. Uh, so I did lots of pictures of LA when I was there. But yeah, I, I do keep them separate. One's for my um, family and friends and one's for the rest of the world. Nice. James, so good to talk to you. I really appreciate your time. Go to beingfreelance.com. There'll be links through so you can find everything that James is up to. And uh, it's well worth delving into everything that he's doing. It, 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 do you know what? As I always say, it doesn't matter about the what people do for a living. It's about the being freelance. And you might sit there thinking, oh, well, James is talking about design and I'm not a designer. It doesn't matter. Go Just go follow what he's doing. And I, I think you'll really enjoy it and be intrigued thank by you. what he's doing. Thanks um, very much, but Steve. for now, James, thank you. And all the best being freelance. Thanks a lot, mate. Take care.